fellow by the name of Israel Folo. I don't know if I got his name right, but that's okay. Folo. He was, at the time, the leading Australian rugby player. Does anybody like rugby? It's a gentleman's sport, right? <laughs> uh, do you know that Israel was at one time sanctioned and they threatened, they threatened to pull away all of his privilege to play rugby professional. It was over a terrible post that he put on social media. Do you want to hear the post that was written? You see, Israel spoke his faith and he said this, the devil has blinded so many people in this world. Repent and turn away from your evil way. We don't have to get political to upset people. We just have to speak our faith. And that's all that God calls us to do. And Israel was being faithful to God. And he said, I have to say what's on my heart and on my mind. And they want to hear me, then they're going to hear what's there. And he was willing to face, even though he loved football, he said, I love my faith even more. And one of the other things that he said is, I love my church family. Now, why would he love his church family? Because he said, throughout it all, they have been behind me. He said, they've had my back. They believed in me. And they've supported me. And they've encouraged me. The question that I put up for all of us today, and we're going to look at it over the next little while, why does God want us to be a part of a church? Why does God want us to be a part of a church? Well, first, let's take a look at what is a church? What, what is the church? In looking at that, we can consider the thoughts. What is the church? What, what the church is not. I'm sorry if I'm a bit tongue-tied. What is the church not? The church is not a building. This building is not a church. This building is a building. That's all there is to it. The church is not an institution. It's not an institution. The church is a spiritual family that we belong to. It's a spiritual family that God leads us to connect with, to be a part of. In Acts chapter 2, verses 41 to 42, those who believed were baptized and added to the church. They joined with the other believers. So what is the church? It's the other believers. It's the body of Christ. And committed themselves to the apostle teaching and to fellowship. They worshiped together regularly at the temple courts and met in small groups in homes for communion and shared meals with great joy and thanksgiving. There's a really good definition of what the church is, the body of Christ is. Is it important, though? I always find this interesting when I read these studies, in particular that are done by non-Christian entities about Christian faith. This group of psychologists got together and they are trying to figure out what is faith? And why is it important? And what kind of a difference did it make? And this is what they found. This is just one of the things that they discovered. 33% of the participants were all Christians indicated that the support of the church, that is the community, the body of Christ, the family, were essential to their faith and well-being. The community. And what they talked about was the interaction. And they talked about the importance of the support. So here are those two things. Those are the key components. They said it's important because we have this interaction. It's important because we have this support. That's the church in essence, isn't it? We get together to encourage one another. We get together to talk. I feel really bad that uh, uh, what is it? Alex and uh, Jake were out there looking for coffee for this morning. Couldn't find any coffee. Why do we have coffee? Because it sort of gives us an opportunity to hang around and, and chat with each other. Why do we chat with each other? We're practically strangers. We come from different households. Because we're all part of the body of Christ. And we share that in common. 
So the question is this, that we should consider is how God blesses and uses us through and in his church. And as I talk about this, I want you to consider, for you, what makes the church valuable? Why is it important to you? But it can't always be about us. It can't always be about you. How can I contribute to making the church important and valuable to others? It's a two-way question. So first we looked at how the church is the family of God. It's our family. First Peter chapter 1, in verse 3, he states this. God has given us, now you just look at these words very clearly. God has given us the privilege of being born again. And so the question is why? So that we are now members of the family of God. So we're born again, and we're born again into the family of God. We are now members of the family of God. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15, it states, that family is the church of the living God. I have the family, uh, the Gilbert family. If you want to go way back in our history, no, we're not going to go there. Our family comes from Northern Ireland. Do you know where I have all of the problems in Northern Ireland? They were mixed up in all of that stuff. I could look at the Gilbert family and I say, I'm so proud to be a Gilbert, but sometimes I look at it and go, no way. But I have been redefined. I have been born again, and I've been born again to Jesus' family, into God's family. And I am so grateful for that family. And I look at that family and go, wow, that family really does honor and bless God and bless others in so many ways. Are we perfect? No, because I'm part of it. The family is the church of the living God and support, the support and the foundation of the truth. Did you get that? We are the support and the foundation of what? Truth. There's a young non-believer in a neighborhood, beautiful neighborhood, all these lovely little homes, cookie cutter homes, you know, they're all the same. Everybody gets along, but this one young neighbor can't stand the one fellow beside him. Why? Because he's a Christian. And it doesn't matter what anything else, it keeps his long good, but he's a Christian and he can't stand him. And he is antagonistic towards his neighbor. He pokes fun of, at him in a malicious way. He pokes fun at his values and his beliefs in a very malicious way. Finally, the neighbor says, he said, I sort of cried out and I, to God and I said, what good does it do? What good does it do? I can't continue to be nice to such a vile person. And he said, God just sort of looked at him and said, would it kill you to do one thing that nobody else sees? Would it kill you to do one nice thing for a neighbor? So he continued on. And through his continual kindness and patience and his witness, his neighbor became a Christian. The problem was that when his neighbor became a Christian, that person's family completely abandoned him and rejected him. They'd have nothing to do with him because now he's a Christian and they hated him. And he's sharing his heart with his neighbor now. And he said, I feel so bad because I love my family dearly and they will have nothing to do with me now that I'm a Christian. But he said, God has showed me through you can be done. That he's given me a new family. And I'm so grateful for the love you've shown me. Do you get it? Do you get it? Let me share another one with you. Bill. He's an upstanding, gracious individual in the community. He's a good family man. He's highly supportive of youth ministry in the church. But Bill grew up in a very cold and distant home. His parents provided basically what he required, but they didn't show him love, and he didn't feel valued and appreciated. However, two families in Bill's neighborhood started inviting two children in that neighborhood to go to church. And every Sunday they would show up faithfully, 
And they would encourage them, and they would pick them up, they would take them to church, and they would bring them back. And some Sundays they would invite them over, these young people, for Sunday meal, and just to get together and have some fun. And at the age of 14, Bill becomes a Christian. And he shares this. He said, I didn't have much of a home life. But you know, at church, it was like I had a bunch of aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters. And he said, it just changed everything for me. I'm sorry, I got to digress for a second, but I got to tell a little joke. A um, little girl told me this today. We were talking about ants. Uh, what kind of ant makes us feel better? Antibiotic. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> she told me that the other day, and I had to chuckle. It's it's a it's a, it's a guy joke, right? <laughs> guy jokes are very simple because never mind. The church is a lively place. It's full of life. It's not a stagnant place because it's the living and breathing body of Jesus. You know, when people generally think of church, they think of a specific location. I'm going to church today. It's on 8th Colonization Road. I'm going to be at the building today. But church is not a building. I said it before. The church is about connections. It's about breathing our faith. It's living our faith. When we talk about Christianity, people hear religion and dogma and rules. But religionity, or Christianity, is all about relationship. Relationship with Jesus, who is our Lord, and relationship with the brothers and sisters that we have in the body of Christ. Jesus didn't die for building. He didn't die so we could hang up a cross in a building. He died for us. He did not give his life for a religion. He gave his life for people. God the Father didn't sacrifice his son for an institution. He did this for you and me. It's not a building. It's not an event. It's a spiritual family. And whether I recognize that reality or not, I belong to the church of God. I am a part of the church of God. And being an active part of that church, I will find, if I look, that they are willing to nourish me and help me and encourage me to participate in nourishing and helping one another. The church, the body of Christ, is a group of believers joined together for the purpose of celebrating and worshiping God and blessing and helping each other. Helping each other to fulfill God's purpose for their life. And when I think about the church, I don't think about perfection. As I said before, because the moment I'm a part of that church, as a moment I join in with those, those believers, well, I bring my imperfections. And I join with them. And their imperfections too. But together, we patiently work it through to encourage one another to lift up the name. Of Jesus. Let's just look for a few moments at the benefits of being part of a church. Well, I'm going to coin this phrase, the benefits of church membership. First, the church helps me to focus. The church helps me to focus. Does anybody have problems focusing? Yeah, we all have problems focusing. I used to say that I was, I loved to multitask, but in reality, multitasking was an excuse to say, well, I didn't do that right because I had so many other things in my mind. Really, you know, if you look at a mind of a brain or a mind of a man, it sort of reads like this. That's about it. But the church helps us to focus. I was dreaming the other day of summer. Yeah, I know it's hard to imagine except for Blair and Vicki, who are still there right now. You said you're in a Zen moment, right? They're going to periodically check out and check back into where they were, okay? We can allow them to do that. We understand. But I was dreaming about summer the other day, and I had it 
interrupted. I was sitting out in a field talking with my friends. We were having a wonderful time. There was a nice little fire. We were talking about old times and all the enjoyment that we had together. And then suddenly at 8 o'clock, something was bugging me. And it was bugging me so much that I had to run inside. Do you know what was bugging me at 8 o'clock at night? Bugs. Mosquitoes. It's irritants like that that are distracting and they take away my focus. I hate to to lay the bad news upon you, but it's coming. The warm weather is coming, I can't wait. And so are mosquitoes. What is the really good thing about winter? No bugs. Right? It's so easy to become distracted when we have minor or major irritants that impact our lives. And they distract us from our focus on, on God. And they can distract us so much that we start looking at things and we go, it's no point, there's no use. And people are distracted at the point of thinking that life is just futile. Let me share with you a few thoughts. Thoughts. Francis Scott Fitzgerald, he's a fictional writer. And he wrote about the flamboyance of the jazz era. We don't have Mike to book fun at because it's back in the 1920s. So, Mike, this one's for you if you're listening. This is what he said. There are only the pursued and the pursuing, the busy and the tired. That was his summation of life. That's it. That's all. Well, Winston Churchill talked about this, and he said, you will never reach your destiny if you stop and throw stones at every barking dog. And here's another saying that's good for us. If you chase two rabbits, both will get away. We need to focus. And the church helps us to focus. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. So when we get together, what do we do with each other? We, we encourage each other in, your, in our faith, right? We want to encourage them because we want to be encouraged ourselves. Here's a couple of thoughts about encouraging. Every day, every day we need to refocus on God. And I have the family to help me. And if I'm struggling, I can reach out. And we can do that so easily through text and email, or phone calls, to reach out and to connect. And they can encourage us to, to refocus. I refocus through prayer. I connect with God through prayer. And I literally connect with one another as I pray for them. So prayer. And then serving God. Do something about our faith. Make it active. Make it live. Make it real. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the things, all these things will be added, provided to you. Here's a thought about focus. We use the, the, the letters of the word focus. Follow one course until successful. Follow one course until successful. Focus on one thing. Blair and I were making sure that we set up the, the words today of the, the Psalms. There were a couple of songs that weren't in there, Blair, too. But we had it all together because Blair and I sat down and we focused and we made it happen, right? All these other things were distractions, but we focused and we made it happen. It was beautiful, right? Thank you. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 3. Fix, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. There is benefits when we focus. An old song, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The second benefit is the church family helps us to deal with life's problems. When we get together, we see how other people are struggling. And when we hear, in that in a sense, a little testimony about how they're struggling and how they're, they're trying to work their way through, it encourages us. Because we see, well, we're not alone in this struggle, in this fight. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says, For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, he says, it is for your comfort and salvation. You get the point there? I'm distressed, but it's comforting you, and it's helpful for your salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort. 
which produces in you patience and endurance in the same sufferings that we suffer. For our hope, and our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. It works, it goes back and forth. Life is a series of problems. We simply go from one problem to the next. Life is about problem solving. Life is about learning coping mechanisms. But in Christ, we can continue to grow and mature and develop. And with each other, we can help each other to grow and mature and to develop. Stephen King, you've heard of Stephen King, he's not my favorite author, but some people like him an awful lot. This is what he wrote one day. Life stinks, then you die. Kind of a fatalistic attitude, isn't it? It doesn't come from an attitude of somebody who knows a loving, caring God who is able to help them. See, God never meant us to go through life on our own. And we know from our own experience that He is with us. But He reminds us continuously that as He is with us, so the body of Christ is with us too. And we need to be there for them as they need to be there for us. We don't have to think alike. We don't have to be alike. I don't see one person dressed the same this morning. We're all different. Some of us, our beards are longer, shorter. Some of us, our hair is there. For the guys, I put that out. We're all different. We don't have to be the same. And we embrace that uniqueness that is each other. And we move forward together. It'd be so boring. We've always known it. It'd be so boring if we're all the same. If we all look the same. We went to Bible college many, many years ago. And their idea was to conform. We all had to look the same. And I said, you're going to be kidding. I'm Irish. You don't want anybody to be like me. We're all different. And we embrace that. And we care and we love and appreciate others just the way they are. Number three, the church family will help strengthen my faith. And again, I go back to Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, which uh, I read earlier on. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, daily, as long as it's called today. Now here's something to think about. So we do that with other people in the church, right? But we need to do that also with the people we're really close to as well. Encourage them daily. Daily. The church helps us. We go to church and we meet people and we see people that we love and we appreciate and who respect us and that we respect. And we see their testimony, a genuine testimony. It's not perfect, but it's genuine. And it helps us because it reminds us what's important. It helps us because it reminds us maybe that we need to tweak our attitudes and our lives a little bit because we can see qualities that we would like to have for ourselves and we go, yes, I'd like to aspire for that. Jesus, work in my life, work in my heart. We don't need to see perfection in them, but we look and we see genuine sincerity in them. And we say, I'd like to be like that. And then, of course, it all points to Jesus. Because when we do things, we want people to see Jesus, right? And number four, the church helps me make a difference. It helps me make a difference. I can have an impact. The church isn't a spectator sport. We're not sitting in an arena looking down and saying, go, I could do better. I was uh, catching the, the two hockey games. The two hockey games that I caught were Canada, US, women. Man, that's fun. That is fun. Do you know that in the first game, the US outshot the Canadians by 53 to 27? Lost. But who won? <laughs> Anybody know? The Canadians won. How did they do that? Now, of course, you would have to say that in that game, the goalie was a pivotal player, the most important player, because she stopped 53 shots. But could she have done that by herself? Could she have scored all those goals? Were all of, were they 53 shots? Were they the only shots that were aimed towards the goal? No. 
Blair knows this. He plays hockey an awful lot. How many times do you block a shot so it doesn't get through to the goalie? How many times do you try to get that puck away so the goalie can take a break for a moment? How many times that when you have the puck, you think, okay, together we're going to score a goal, and you score a goal, and it helps the goalie? It's a team. It's not a spectator sport. It's everybody working together. And doing that, we all make a difference. We all make a difference. God draws us here to have an impact on us so that we can have an impact on others. So I'm just going to close with a couple of <coughs> quick questions. Just a couple of quick questions. Maybe God is looking at us today. He's giving us these questions. What did you do with my son, Jesus? With all that he's done for you, what have we done for Jesus? Have we opened up our lives to him? Have we allowed him to come in and be our savior? Have we recognized our need for him? Have we recognized that he's the only one who can save us, redeem us, cleanse us? Have we done that? Are we living an attitude of gratitude? Every morning we get up and we go, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I mean, I'm, I'm part of your family today. Thank you, Lord. What did you do with my son, Jesus? And then the second question. What did you do with what I gave you? I'm not going to read that this morning. It's Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 30. If you want homework, Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 30. Jesus, God, looks at us and says, What did you do with what I gave you? Are you using the church as an opportunity to use your gifts and values to bless and encourage one another? That's right. Thank you, God, for the church. Not an institution, not a building. It's your living and breathing body. And we are grateful. We are grateful for each other. We're grateful how other people can encourage us and how we may be able to encourage other people. Help us, Lord, 